The Battle of the Coral Sea is quite an interesting and impactful battle in the early stages of the Second World War in the Pacific, between Imperial Japan and the Allies. It would see the first battle in which two opposing sides would not fire upon each other with guns, but use aircraft from over the horizon to deal killing blows to enemy ships. But most importantly, it would set the stage for the all-important Battle of Midway, decreasing the amount of aircraft carriers either side could bring to the table, and possibly changing the outcome of that decisive battle. It is May of 1942, and the Japanese have been advancing southward since their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and other European and American possessions in the Pacific. After these successful invasions, there were two schools of thought in the Japanese military. Some were cautious leaders that it would be prudent to spend time consulting what gains they had made because their supply lines were stretched almost to their limits. While others wanted to expand their conquests even further to obtain more natural resources for, let's call it their less than adequate supply of necessary raw materials. However, in April of 1942, the minds of the Japanese leaders were made up after the Doolittle raid on the home islands, where James Doolittle led a group of bombers on a one-way trip to bomb the Japanese capital and other areas. Because of this, the Japanese leaders realized that they were not invulnerable. So, Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Inoue, commander of the 4th Fleet, wanted to take New Guinea and occupy the Solomon Islands, thus providing a protective barrier for the Japanese holdings in the former Dutch East Indies, and would give the Japanese a base to bomb Northern Australia, and provide for operations against New Caledonia, Samoa, and Fiji, and because of that, cut off communications between the United States and Australia. Now, on the flip side of that coin, we have the United States, who were still reeling from the surprise attacks on Pearl Harbor, and had a lot to prove with a lot less ships than they hoped for if war broke out in the Pacific. Not to mention the stakes being set pretty high, with essentially the fall of the Pacific to a new overlord if they failed. And on top of that, with limited backing due to the Europe First policy set up in the Arcadia Conference. Admiral Ernest King, who is the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Navy, seized upon some rather vague wording to send support to Australia, New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands, as he knew it would be vital for the war effort in future counterattacks. But by January 23, 1942, the anchor of the Japanese perimeter was the Port of Rabaul in New Guinea, which meant the Japanese could more easily attack the supply lines from the U.S. to Australia. Understanding this, the United States would have to protect Australia in these vital supply lines. Admiral Chester Nimitz, who was the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Theater, accepted the responsibility of protecting Australia, which would draw the United States into the Coral Sea, right in the path of the oncoming Japanese offensive to take control of this vital area. However, with all the issues the United States faced early on in the war effort, they had one advantage. They knew what the Japanese were planning, as American codebreakers had broken the Japanese naval code, and so Nimitz was able to plan accordingly for the Japanese attack and send ships to the Coral Sea. Bringing it back to the Japanese, as I had mentioned previously, their supply lines were severely overstretched and it would make an invasion of Australia unsustainable. So their target would be Port Moresby in Australian New Guinea, which could be used as a platform for which to attack Fiji, New Caledonia, and Samoa. Still, there were other powerful voices in higher ranks of the Japanese Navy who thought other options at this time would be more prudent. Admiral Yamamoto and his combined fleet thought if they headed east and took Midway, Johnston, and Palmyra Islands and posed a more real threat to Hawaii, it would force the Americans to have no other option but to protect their own territory and engage in that battle, and by doing so, essentially give the Japanese a free hand in the Southern Pacific if victorious. But the General Naval Staff won out, and the attack on Port Moresby would be continued to be planned. So, when Navy Order 18 came in early May, which laid out the Japanese plan to attack Midway in early June, Yamamoto would be deprived of some of the forces he could bring to bear at Midway. The attack on Port Moresby was known as Operation M.O., and the attack force was Task Force M.O., which consisted of Vice Admiral Takeo Takagi, who commanded the main striking force, which was built up around Carrier Division 5, which contained Shokaku and Zuikaku with heavy cruiser and destroyer escorts. Rear Admiral Aritomo Goto commanded the covering group, which consisted of the light carrier Shoho and four heavy cruiser escorts, and one destroyer. Rear Admiral Kideyoshi Shima led the Tulagi invasion group, which was to establish a seaplane base on Tulagi in the Solomon Islands. The support group was to establish a base southeast of New Guinea in the Louisiade Islands. Admiral Sadamichi Kajioka would lead the main invasion force of Port Moresby. This force would consist of 11 transports and 8 escorts, the leader of Operation MO, commander of the 4th Fleet Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Inoue, would be based out of Rabaul. The Japanese plan was a simple but difficult one, protect the Port Moresby invasion force. The striking force, covering, and the actual invasion force were all beginning from different areas, 
but the striking force was coming from Truk, the major Japanese naval base, and would sail around the eastern side of the Solomon Islands. Starting from Bougainville, the covering force would take a different route, sailing southwest towards the Jormon Passage. The two forces would catch the Americans in a pincer move by entering the Coral Sea from opposite sides. The support group would come from the coast of New Guinea and sail past the Jormon Passage. Finally, the Port Moresby invasion force would leave Rabaul, sail south to the Jormon Passage, and head west towards their ultimate objective of Port Moresby. A lot to take in, I know, but thankfully, the American plan is just a little bit more simple. The American plan was to attack enemy ships and prevent them from capturing Port Moresby. Through the knowledge of the Japanese naval code, and by April of 1942, the Americans could read about 85% of the code signals. Admiral Nimitz, who was in charge of the Pacific Fleet, had some rather interesting constraints placed on him. Now, a lot of capital ships were undergoing repairs from the Pearl Harbor attack, or were patrolling the United States' west coast because they would not really be useful in combat. Not only that, but Enterprise and Hornet had not yet returned from their raid on Tokyo, and Saratoga was undergoing repairs from torpedo hits. So it was up to Lexington and Yorktown with their task forces 11 and 17 respectively to go to the Coral Sea and try to stop the Japanese advance in its tracks. The Americans would be led by Admiral Jack Fletcher. Although not an aviator himself, Nimitz felt that Fletcher could come up with the tactics needed to beat back the Japanese. Fletcher understood that he was at quite the disadvantage, with only around 150 planes available to bring to the battle, a force that could be overwhelmed by the might of the Japanese war machine. Nevertheless, Fletcher began his operations in the Coral Sea on May 1, 1942, understanding a new A's invasion fleet would be leaving Rabaul on May 3rd. Fletcher was going to try to be there before the Japanese and essentially get the drop on the Japanese force. Heading northwest, Fletcher arrived around 550 miles south of Guadalcanal on May 2nd. Then on May 3rd, the Japanese kicked off Operation M.O., and early on that day, Shima's invasion force of Tulagi began disembarking without any resistance as the Australians had evacuated it. And this group began to build their seaplane base as per the orders in Operation M.O. Godo's covering force with Shoho covered the landings and then turned towards Bougainville later in the afternoon. Fletcher was aware of the Japanese invasion force and prepared to head north, but what he did not know is that Task Force 11, which had completed refueling with Lexington, was only 69 miles to the east of Task Force 17, as radio silence was maintained. He intended for Yorktown to launch airstrikes on Tulagi the following morning. On the morning of May the 4th, the Japanese on Tulagi, along with the ships offshore, heard the sound of 12 Devastator torpedo bombers and 28 Dauntless dive bombers from Yorktown. The U.S. aircraft hit a minesweeper and seriously damaged the destroyer. The Japanese alerted the other groups of Operation Omo that the Americans were in the Coral Sea in force, contrary to what was expected. The Americans refueled the aircraft and returned to destroy two more minesweepers and damage a patrol craft, along with strafing another destroyer which killed the captain of the ship. The Americans sent a third strike of Dauntless dive bombers, which further damaged the minesweepers. Fletcher had plans for further attacks, however, B-25 bombers had located Admiral Goto's force south of Bougainville, and thus Task Force 17 with Yorktown leading headed south. The Japanese had not been idle since learning of the attack on Tulagi. They had been searching for U.S. carriers in the area, and by May the 6th, they were flying recon missions from Tulagi. By 8.30 of May the 5th, Task Force 17 and 11 had met up. This caused Fletcher to reorganize his fleet into smaller task forces that would separate this command of the combined force into five subcommands to make things a little bit more manageable. The task force would be supported by PBY Catalinas, along with medium heavy bombers from the United States Army Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force. That day, wildcats from Yorktown shot down a Japanese aircraft, along with that learning that the Japanese planned on landing at Port Moresby by May the 10th. So Fletcher decided to move his task force into position to strike, moving northwest towards the likely route that the Japanese would take. That same day, Admiral Takagi's striking force entered the Coral Sea, having no idea the strength or position of Fletcher's task force, and by midday were in position for the expected line of retreat of the U.S. carriers. With all this going on, it means the Battle of the Coral Sea was officially on, the two sides were going to throw some real haymakers. May the 6th didn't see much action during the day. The Japanese continued to maneuver into position, and the U.S. forces spent most of their day refueling and then sailing north, preparing for the attack on the Port Moresby invasion force. By the night of May the 6th, however, Goto's covering force was spotted and attacked by B-17s from Australia, dropping bombs near Shoho, but were driven off by Japanese fighters. Fletcher realized what the Japanese were about to do with their planned pincer maneuver and regrouped the ships back into one single task force and headed west, 
sending the destroyer USS Sims and the fleet tanker Neosho south towards a new fueling position. May the 7th would be a very active day for both sides. One of the first actions of the day was the Japanese spotting the Sims in Neosho at around 8 a.m. They were incorrectly reported as an aircraft carrier and an escorting cruiser, to which the Japanese sent out a large strike force to go deal with this threat. The poor Sims in Neosho were hopelessly outmatched by the experienced Japanese pilots and attempted to maneuver and dodge, but it was only a matter of time before they were sunk. With Sims going down that day, Neosho hanging on to around the 11th, when the ship was finally sunk. Because Admiral Hara had sent out such a large force to attack what turned out to be a secondary target, his forces would not be ready to attack Fletcher's group later on in the day. Fletcher took his time scouting for Japanese carriers, to which he found Shoho, but due to incorrect coding, it was reported as two carriers and four cruiser escorts. Fletcher, eager to strike, sent out 93 aircraft to what turned out to be again a secondary target in comparison to the larger Japanese force. Shoho faced the full fury of the American attack, taking 11 bomb hits and 7 torpedo hits, and sank by 11.35 a.m., prompting Commander Robert Dixon, the commander of the dive bomber group for Lexington, to send the now-famous message, Scratch One Flat Top. After hearing of Fletcher's attack on Shoho, the Japanese ordered the Port Moresby invasion force back and to wait for revised orders while sending out scouting aircraft to search for Fletcher's ships. The Japanese did not exactly locate the American ships, but had a general idea of where they were. So they sent out a group of 27 aircraft with the best record of night fighting, but were not able to spot the American ships. But the Americans spotted them with radar and sent wildcats after them, shooting down nine of the Japanese aircraft. At midnight on the 8th, Admiral Nui decided that the invasion of Port Moresby would be delayed in favor of finding the American carriers. But unknown to Nui, the Americans were already leaving the area. May the 8th would see more action between the two sides, at approximately 8.20 in the morning, scouts from both sides located one another. The Americans would strike Shokaku since Wikaku was hidden from view by clouds. Shokaku would receive two 1,000-pound bombs, which forced the carrier to turn north after transferring her aircraft to Zuikaku. Zuikaku's luck would continue as it was hidden from view from the sight of the Americans by a rainstorm. Rainstorms seemed to favor the Japanese that day because a scout plane used a rain cloud as cover to guide a strike team to Lexington. 14 torpedo bombers would attack Lexington as she would try to avoid these torpedoes, but would be simultaneously hit by strikes on either side of the bow. Wildcat combat air patrols attempted to prevent further damage, but were unable to do so as Japanese dive bombers appeared and were able to strike Lexington. By 11.45 on the 8th, Yorktown would be attacked as well. Despite the vicious attack from the Japanese, the carrier would only be struck by a 250 kilogram bomb. Both American carriers were able to recover their aircraft, but Lexington was not looking good. From the outside, things appeared to be looking alright for Lexington. The ship would survive the hits and the fires were out, the torpedo damage was repaired, and she was about to have an even keel. But aviation fuel fumes had been leaking into a compartment, which housed a running generator. Sparks set off an explosion that killed 25 crewmen. The ship had more explosions go off that started raging fires that could not be contained. The decision was made to abandon Lexington. As she burned, the destroyer Phelps launched five torpedoes into her to make sure that she sank. Fletcher withdrew the remaining task force south, and with that, the Battle of the Coral Sea was over. Now, there are some takeaways from this battle I'd like to highlight. First of all, the Japanese would be out three aircraft carriers for the upcoming Battle of Midway, with Shoho sunk, Shokaku severely damaged, and Zuikaku's air group crippled, which would have obvious implications for the upcoming Battle of Midway. Another important thing I briefly mentioned was the loss of pilots. The loss of these extremely experienced Japanese pilots was debilitating for the Navy, while the American air crews would get better and better. Now, the Americans would lose Lexington in this engagement, but this battle would prove impactful for the U.S. Navy, with a lot of experience gained in several important fields, like communication, air combat, and critically, damage control. As for world history, as I mentioned in the intro, it was the world's first battle in which opposing navies did not engage in surface combat, as well as setting the stage for the Allied forces eventually turning the tide of the war in the Pacific against the Japanese. If you guys enjoyed this new style of video, I hope to do more like this in the future. It definitely takes a lot more research and script writing, but it has been extremely fun to make. Please remember to like and subscribe to see more content like this.